This is a Milwaukee PBS Listen MKE special presentation. Welcome to another installment of Listen MKE, a partnership between WUWM, Milwaukee's NPR, the Ideas Lab at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Milwaukee Public Library, and Milwaukee Public Television. I'm investigative solutions reporter Tyler Shelbourne with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and I will be co-hosting with environmental reporter Susan Fence of WUWM, Milwaukee's NPR. So glad to be with you, Talis. We're here with two guests, Dr. Venetia mckinney Whitson. She's a family medicine physician and assistant professor at the Medical College of Wisconsin's Department of Family and Community Medicine. Dr. mckinney Whitson is also the director of All Saints Family Medicine Residency in Milwaukee and the director of both community medicine and maternity care. She's a very busy person. We're also joined by Deanna Branch, a wonderful mom, parent of a child, who's been infected by lead and um, is an advocate for identifying and eliminating lead poisoning and being, she's also a resource for other parents. Yeah, and we're gonna start with uh, Dr. McKinney here. So what are some common sources of lead poisoning and how can people best avoid them? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, we learn a lot of, or we know a lot about um, lead in the water as well as, um, lead and paint. And so those are some of the some of the major um, sources of lead for our community here in, in Milwaukee. Um, in Milwaukee's north side area, um, we have about 70,000 lead pipelines in Milwaukee. So um, that is a source, that is a big source of um, lead for our Milwaukee children. Um, also soil. So um, we, we, we think about water, we think about soil, soil being that a lot of these homes that have lead paint in them um, are, are, you know, whether they've been had abatement or if they've had any kind of reconstruction or any renovation and that lead that is on the exterior of the house or even on the interior of the house, um, uh, the exterior house, it, it causes lead to be in the soil. Um, and then, of course, we all know about lead paint. So um, before 1977, 1978, um, that was when we stopped putting lead in our paint. Um, and so if homes were built before that time, the likelihood of them having lead is very high. Um, and so when our children are looking out the window or, you know, by the windowsill and it's chip paint, you know, by the window or chip paint off, off the wall, um, that definitely um, poses lead exposure to our to, to, to our children um, here in Milwaukee. Um, so those are the main re main sources is soil, um, paint, and water. Um, you also can get some in, inhaled so sources, which is, you know, just the dust. If anyone is doing any kind of renovation um, in their homes um, and their home has been built before 1977, 1978, then it's so important that we protect our children by not having them in those um, in, in the home when renovations are taking place, because you can definitely inhale lead as well. So, Deanna Branch, uh, thank you, too, for being with us. And um, we'd, we'd love to have you share a bit about your son's um, lead story, how he was exposed, if, you're, if you know how that happened. Well, I have more um, understanding now of how it happened. Um, it was a, a shock to me. It wasn't um, until a routine um, finger poke at the WIC office that I realized how severe and exactly what you know what was going on with him. I just chalked it up as terrible tools because he was so young when it happened. But the main source I'm determining by the the building, the apartment that we were staying in, it was a very old building. A lot of um, lead paint, uh, chip lead paint they found in the window sills, um, on the walls, um, the lead pipes, the water. So he definitely was exposed to it from both of the main aspects of contracting lead poisoning. Um, at the time, I wasn't aware, but now that I'm thinking back and doing my research, I definitely could see that the house was a lead magnet, and it came to the point where um, the landlord tried to do renovations to get rid of the um, the paint. And then um, they, we were told to come back into uh, the house after the lead um, paint in the windows were removed, and he contracted lead poisoning again. 
just from drinking the water. So it, it was just an ongoing struggle to the point where we had to leave that apartment and find um, a better housing. So it, it was it was a struggle with him. His leg got to the point where it was, I want to say uh, at or above 60. Um, I guess 10 it would be the highest uh, it could get for if he could be considered lead poison or below 10, I believe is the it's the standard they want to be at below 10 to consider the child to be uh, lead safe or not as in much um, in danger, but he had to be hospitalized twice for it over a two week period. And yeah, it was very, very tough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. sounds sound really, difficult. really difficult. And yeah. um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, Dr. What's, um, McKinney, sorry, <laughs> is um, what do you think parents should be doing in terms of testing and keeping an eye out for symptoms? Um, what, what should they know about that? Um, right. Yeah, so Deanna, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, so I want to, you know, uh, be be clear that no amount of lead in blood is is good. Um, so you know, we our goal is for it to be less than one. Um, we know that if it's greater than five, we can actually see some effects on children. Um, and that can range from, um, you know, like cognitive. Um, a cognitive impairment. Um, we know that one in five children that have been diagnosed with ADHD actually um, have had a lead, lead poisoning or lead exposure. Um, so we know it can really change our, 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 our you know, like our, our children in different aspects. Uh, we know it could cause anemia, it could decrease their hearing, um, slow their growth. Um, so, and, and the cognitive function is is a, is a big thing because sometimes we think, oh, okay, yeah, like you said, the therapy tools, you know, like maybe my child is so like hyperactive or inattentive or impulsive. Um, and the first thing we think about is ADHD. Um, but the first thing that I think about as a physician is let me check the lead to make sure that it is less than one, um, being that we know anything that's greater than five can affect children. Um, so to get back to your question um, about like what parents can do, I mean, is 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 being you know like have getting educated by their physicians and educating themselves so that they can make good decisions for their for their children and be a, a parent advocate. Um, so for for physicians, we like to check check the lead three. We we do this little mnemonic that's three by the age of three. Um, so three by the age of three, meaning that we check it at twelve months. Um, we should check it around 24 months and at um, uh, 36 months. And of course, if it's elevated any time in between there, then we're going to check it more frequently. Um, and then if there has been a child that hasn't had any lead testing and they're by the age of six, then they should get it tested at least one time. Um, so I think parents can, you know, definitely when they go to their well child visits, um, talk to their physician. Know, you know, you know, know exactly what... Um, what, what your child's lead number was. Like I said, you want that to be less than one. Um, so I think for, for sure, a parent, that's one thing that parents can do. And definitely if you notice, if you know that you're living in a home that's, um, that's older than 1977, then you want to be, you know, you want to watch your children and make sure they're not eating, um, you know, like eating by the windowsill or um, eating the paint. And one thing is lead, when lead based, based paint has like, um, I haven't tasted it, but um, from what I've, what I've read is that it has an almond flavor to it. Can, so it can kind of be very sweet for children. Um, so um, they will eat it because it's, you know, it has a sweet flavor to it. Um, but I think the main thing that parents can definitely do is just be an advocate for their patients, make sure that they bring that up at their physicians, um, at, at their well child visits with their physician, um, with their child's physician. Um, and then just making sure you're washing, your kids are washing their hands before and after eating, even more so with, you know, COVID, we're doing a better job on that, but continue to wash your hands um, before and after eating. Um, also, when they come in from playing, you know, because like I said, you can find lead in the soil. So if they're outside playing and they want to come in for a snack, make sure that they wash their hands um, um, when they come into the house. Um, and then also, if you're doing any renovations, try to, you know, like not expose your children to that because like I said, it can be in health. So, Deanna, you know, parents have so much to juggle, and clearly the, the advice that Dr. McKinney has given is, is sound. When you think back on your experience and what you've learned since your son's contamination, you know, what do you want fellow parents to know? 
I just want them to know um, there are resources. My church was the main resource for me. Um, when my son's lead poison got to be severe, there was um, people from the lead um, program to come by my house um, and do an inspection. At first it was just like letters and just pamphlets I would get, but once this lead poison became more severe, I've got more help. So I felt like parents should just be more aware um, and to seek out additional resources and do their research on their own to learn more about um, the causes and effects of lead poisoning. And the most important thing is just be more patient with your children and understand it's a process for them as well that you're going through to just um, be more patient with them and be supportive. Dr. McKinney, is, do you think the pandemic, I know you mentioned it has exacerbated lead exposure and if so, how, like what are some of the things that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question because COVID has affected us in so many ways, um, but it definitely has, it, it's affected um, lead poisoning or lead exposure in, in, in a couple ways. Number one, children are at home now. I mean, not everyone is back to school. I guess some districts are going back, but kids are in, in at home a lot more. So that means that if they're home, um, allows it, it has a lot of lead in there in the paint in the water and they're at home more frequently for a longer duration of time and that means that their exposure can be higher um the other thing is because when COVID hit, we rightfully so wanted to protect our children. So a lot of physicians' office, we kind of halted um, some of our well-child visits because if the child was doing well, we didn't want to expose them to COVID or um, other people that, we didn't want to expose them to COVID and put them in that situation where they end up being quarantined or they get negatively affected from coming into our office. So with that being said, we held a lot of our well-child visits. And um, lead testing is something that you usually do at a, at a well child visit. Um, so your routine checkup with your pediatrician or your family physician. Um, and, you know, we go through all of growth charts. We discuss what we can do to improve the child's um, health care. But one thing is we do test lead. Um, and being that we weren't bringing our children in, we weren't testing lead. So I know in, in, in Milwaukee, we're down by like, I, I believe, like 30 percent of um, testing. Um, here in the city of Milwaukee. And I think just some research I've done across the United States, we just haven't been testing our children as much for lead because of COVID. So it has ne COVID has negatively affected um, the care that we are providing children in that, um, in that aspect. So we want you to know you're watching an event from Listen MKE, which is a partnership between WUWM, Milwaukee's NPR, the Idea Lab at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, the Milwaukee Public Library, and Milwaukee Public Television. I think, Talis, you have a, a listener question. We do, and they, the listener wanted to know if all providers, so like All Saints 16th Street Clinic, if they check all pregnant women and children for lead, essentially they want to know if it's routine, um, and if not, why not? Yeah, so great question. So yeah, we routinely check children for lead. Like I said, we check at 12 months, so at their one year visit, um, at their 20, 24th month visit and the 36th month visit. Um, and then of course, in between, if, if one is elevated, then I might check you know, someone, the child's lead a little bit sooner, or if someone else in the household um, had tested positive for lead, then I will check all of those children, even if they're out of that range of the, tw you know, one, two year olds. Um, so it is routine. When it comes to pregnant women, it's a little bit different. We do know that um, pregnant women that have been exposed to lead, um, it has been shown that it can have some effects on their fetus. Um, but some of our organizations that we get gu guidelines from look at risk and benefits. And um, unless mom is having, um, is symptomatic, or if she has a child that has been exposed um, to lead or we know that she is living in a home where there is a high lead exposure and we can definitely uh, test the pregnant woman but routinely like say if you came into the office and um, you were pregnant and you were getting your prenatal labs I wouldn't necessarily um, test you for lead unless after we, after we had a conversation you explained to me like oh yeah my other children have been um, exposed to lead and their numbers have been high or I know for sure you know like my house is is connected to a lead um, pipeline, then unless you gave me more reasons, then I wouldn't routinely check you for lead. 
so Deanna, another question has come in and this one's for you. It um, this person asked, how do you take care of yourself, your health and well-being when you're so busy caring for your sons? Not you have two sons. Yeah, I have two boys and um, I recently had to deal with my own health issues as far as um, stage four kidney failure. So Aiden's um, diet that he's on for his lead is actually helping me as far as eating better, healthier, no more sodas, juice, junk food. Um, I got a pamphlet that said like a lot of junk food and other processed foods are, you know, high in lead. And I want him to get more iron rich foods because um, because of the lead, he does have ADHD down and also anemia. So his diet is definitely different, uh, but it's a lot better now. And he's actually um, leaning more towards being a vegetarian or a vegan. And so his um, his diet has definitely changed and improved my health and my other son's health too, also struggling with weight issues. So it's actually improving our, our lifestyle and our health overall. It is so important that we, you know, like we are feeding our children iron rich foods. Um, so the dark green leafy vegetables, things that are iron enriched. Um, also vitamin C. So vitamin C is something that I always give to patients when um, they are um, iron deficient because the vitamin C allows them to absorb the iron even better. Um, so vitamin C and then also making sure they have a lot of calcium in their diet. Um, so those are the, all of the things that I, I think that is important to share with parents that if your child um, are low or deficient, de deficient in these things, it can put them at risk for lead. And if they've been exposed to lead, even more so, we should make sure that those vitamins are right where they should be. Gotcha. And we've got a, a listener's question um, that I'm going to combine a little bit with the question I was going to ask, which is, what are some important things parents can do if they have um, children with elevated lead levels? One of the things this, this, um, that Candace uh, wanted to know is who they can contact um, if they uh, need to get their home tested for lead because they think their children are might be um, poisoned. And also, they're wondering if it can be passed through breast milk. Um, if, if a mother is uh, uh, exposed. Okay, so that's a, that's a lot of question, but I can start with the with the breast milk. Um, so yeah, it actually can be passed through breast milk, but it has to be at such a high level. Um, so mom's level, I believe, um, has to be like greater than 50 to 60, if I'm not mistaken, um, for it to be passed through um, breast milk. So what we usually do is, you know, if, if we know that mom has been exposed to lead and we've checked it and it's greater than 50 to 60 um, micrograms per deciliter, then we would probably say, you know, breastfeeding is not the right thing for you. Um, just, and it's probably, it's going to be beneficial to the child for you not to breastfeed. Um, but levels that are lower than that, it's okay to breastfeed. You just want to make sure that your diet is high in vitamin C and in iron as well as calcium. Now, Talis, I'm sorry, what was the first part of um, what was the first part of the question? Um, so yeah, it was who who she could contact to get uh, lead tests, and she was wondering if it was at the renter's expense or landlord uh, landlords, um, which I think is a little bit of a different question in terms of who could answer that for sure. Okay. But um, yeah, I can take a little bit of it. Um, so, you know, I think getting the resources, um, well, getting the resources for testing, you're going to get that at your doctor's office. I know some people will go to the WIC office. Um, and so for from my aspect, when lead when leads are elevated, um, there's a protocol that we go through for the Department of uh, uh, Milwaukee. We have health department. There is um, a protocol depending on what level the lead is, um, depends on what, what are the next steps. Um, but once the lead gets above 10, for sure, um, like I recently had a case where um, someone, one of my children, um, one of my patients, uh, lead was elevated. And so that meant that, you know, I, I talked to mom, I said, yes, the, the lead is elevated. I tried to get more information of, you know, like, what was the reason that this, you know, she's been, hasn't, she's lived in the same home, but, um, you know, these numbers have not been elevated in the past. So just getting more information after, um, getting that information in, we, retested the retested the baby um 
probably in like a couple weeks and, and wanted to see if that number was going up or higher. In between time, the Milwaukee Health Department was contacted and, and they gave resources to the patient. And then also my office um, will gave resources um, intermittently, making sure that, you know, like the Milwaukee Health Department has touch base with mom. Um, and then when, it, when the levels are much higher, I think from my experiences, it usually is the landlord's um, expense, but um, those are resources that the health department can help you with for sure. So Deanna, you've rented, um, I know that you said that you, you've you just recently moved again and to, that you're very happy to be in a new space with your sons. And we're not speaking about all landlords here. Clearly every situation is different, but, but what was your experience um, in having a landlord and when your son was diagnosed and then was found to have led again? It was very stressful um, just to get them to um, come out and treat the windows. It had to be um, the health department that reached out and did the, uh, I would say a lead inspection, a lead report. And after the report was, they, they pretty much came to the house and did an inspection of all the windows. And that's where they found all the lead in the paint. Um, I, got, I think in the soil outside of the house too, where he played at, as well as the, uh, the lead pipes, they checked the pipes uh, for lead, um, the water pipes. It took all of that um, for the health inspector to come out and do a report, send it to the landlord for them to do the um, first um, treatment of the windows. And then I was told that, you know, once he was discharged from the hospital, that he would be safe to return home. And um, what the doctor did warn me was that the medicine that he was on to get rid of the lead so fast, the succimer, made him more susceptible to lead if he was exposed to it again. So that's the reason why the second time he was exposed, it was a lot worse and it was a lot higher. And it got to the point where he had to be in the hospital, I think right after, right before Christmas, uh, it was Black Friday, he had to go be immediately rushed to the hospital again. Um, Cause at that point he was getting routine lead checks because his lead was so high, they wouldn't even poke his finger. They took the blood straight from the vein. That's why he has a fear of needles now. So it got to the point where um, once he was admitted to the hospital again, uh, I think someone from the health department came into the hospital while he was there and made just made, made me feel awful. They pretty much said something like, we can't release your son into your care again or uh, discharge from the hospital until you can provide a safe place for him. So I just felt like I was, I thought I was providing a safe place for him. I felt like it was my fault for paying rent there, for going back after he was exposed the first time. I had to resort to live with family members that I'm finally on my own feet now. I'm finally more independent and have my own place now that he's safe. But once we moved out of that apartment, um, it just it was just very stressful. It came with a lot of um, me skipping out on my rent because I refused to pay rent there for a place that was literally hurting and killing my son. I felt like I, I felt like I just left that month and and I just charged um, for my son from the hospital. We wouldn't stay with family members and his lead improved dramatically. It went down and stayed down. Is he still technically is lead poison? I believe it's at 21 now, but that's just a lot better than what it was. So I just feel blessed that we're somewhere safe where his lead is um, continuously going down. Once it gets into the bone, they told me it takes a little bit longer for the lead to get out of the body, but it's still slowly but surely leaving this body. So I just feel blessed that it's sad that it took all of that and it came to that, but I'm just glad that we're somewhere safer and that he's doing a lot better. Yeah, to that end, um, I did want to ask you, uh, Dr. McKinney, because I know you mentioned sometimes parents will stay at a place um, and it'll be fine, but they don't think about their children going to the grandparents' house or to some other place where they're yes. regularly at. Can you speak um, to kind of just housing in general and being aware of different sources of lead in different areas? Yes, 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 yes. So the thing is, a lot of times you think about, oh, okay, let me see, we're, when was your house built? But if the, if you work every day and your child stays at the grandparents' house and the grandparents' house was built in 1960, then we need to know that. And I need to investigate that to say, oh, okay, that's probably where the lead exposure is coming from. So I think it's important to ask the question, not only, you know, like when, did, when was your house built, but also all the places that my child spends their time, what year was that house built? build? What, um, what kind of water supply do they have? Um, so exposure is everything. And, and we can't just, um, you know, like just go down the path of what, what 
is at our home, but every place that our child goes to, um, we we should think about that as well. With water, that is a, a big source um, of lead. And so I, I, I would tell um, pa parents or new moms that are going home, you know, make sure that um, when you're making bottles, um, that you're not using tap water. Um, so we know that 50% of infants that have lead exposure, it comes from parents mixing the formula with um, tap water. Um, if you have to use water for some reason, you know, um, then you want to run that that faucet for like in the morning when you first wake up, turn the faucet on on cold water, do that for 10 minutes um, first of the day, just to try to clear out some of that um, lead. Um, also the faucet aerator. So that's like that little kind of screen that sits up under the faucet. You want to make sure that you keep that nice and clean because lead can actually like um, get stuck on there. And so every time you run the faucet, a little bit of that is getting into your glass um, or you're using that. The other thing parents sometimes think is, oh, okay, if I boil the water, that will make it better for my for my child. We know that boiling the water just concentrates the the lead. Uh, using a, a filter um, at home, whether that's, you know, like the filter that you put in the refrigerator, you know, like you put the water in and it sifts through and you put it in the refrigerator or you put it on your faucet, just making sure because there's a lot of companies out there that, I mean, you think, oh, okay, it's a filter, it should filter out the lead, but make sure that it is filtering out lead that is on the label. So read the fine print. Thank you so much, Dr. McKinney. Thank you so much, Deanna Branch. I appreciate you coming on to share this information with us. Um, and yeah, we also want to thank all of you out there for, for watching and tuning in. This has been another installment of Listen MKE, a partnership between WUWM, Milwaukee's NPR, the Ideas Lab at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, the Milwaukee Public Library, and Milwaukee Public Television. Uh, and thank you, of course, to my co-host, Susan. Um, it's been uh, great at helping us put this together. So thank you. Thank you. Uh,